Are we seeing uh, the screen? Yes, I think so. Yep. Okay. Well, here we are. Welcome, everyone, back to Libraries in Response. This is session 99 since we started in March of 2020, as many of you know, and some of you were there, in response to the pandemic. And then a series of uh, crises that just kept coming after that, you know, the social crisis from the Floyd murder, the, the economic crisis, the, uh, the political crisis, the, the ever-present pervasive climate crisis. Now we have something we could consider an IT crisis. So libraries have to respond to all of this. Interesting how they do that. Uh, this is our session today, our speaker, Corey Doctorow, how to end the Inchita scene and usher in a new good internet. This is great. Uh, uh, Corey returns. He was with us a year ago uh, with twiddling and shitification the later day, latter day robber barons of the internet. So it seems like that Corey spent the last year illuminating this uh, problem, this circumstance. And now is turned to a response to that, which is good news. So that's what we're going to hear today. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, open collaboration of, of uh, innovative tech-using libraries. And we are hosted and recorded by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in The Hague, longtime partner with us in the the campaign for universal public access. Every community should have some sort of a facility like a library where anybody can go for free or very low fee and participate in this digital environment that we created. Our sponsor this year, our principal sponsor this year is the Institute for Museum and Library Services, offered us a grant to help this uh, uh, program continue. We really appreciate that. Other sponsors have been wonderful for us, the Internet Society, the, uh, the library, State Library of Michigan, uh, New Jersey, and Texas, along with our media partners, Library Journal and Broadband Breakfast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> uh, this has become our, our sort of favorite go-to illustration of the point I was making about a series of virtual cascade of crises, that the poor world uh, uh, longs for the simpler days of merely worrying about nuclear annihilation. Now we have the new four horsemen of the apocalypse, including our friend AI there. Uh, imagine now the libraries of the world kind of supporting the world in this, in, in uh, resisting these, the forces of these uh, crises. Uh, this is an, an interesting uh, concept to us, is polycrisis, it's not merely you know, multiple crises. It's how they interact and interdepend and reinforce each other and create an increase. We're always full of good news here at Libraries in Response, but you keep coming back for it. So you obviously you're paying attention and, and you're, you're taking these things seriously. Upcoming, uh, we're taking it on the road. Uh, we're going to be in uh, Brussels a week from today. Wow. Uh, and, and this is a big uh, data privacy conference. And so we've we've been awarded uh, press credentials there, and we will be covering the event and doing a session from from Brussels on this is about, you know about protection and everybody's freaking out about AI and how can we protect it? How can we how can we control it? How can we uh, have regulations? How can we have system controls that can protect us from uh, protect our data and so forth from it? And our point uh, that we'll be making, we do make, is that that unless users are capable, then they'll undermine any any regime of security. Clueless and careless users are just you know, so that implies then the need for education and, and training or so-called AI literacy. It's interesting how we keep using this word literacy for some kind of knowledge that applies to things that are not necessarily literate, but we keep using it anyway. The new idea, uh, which is recently uh, arising, which is really attractive to us, is this notion of AI as a public infrastructure. We think this is really interesting. We don't know. I mean, it's, it's complicated, of course, and uh, but it does seem possible. There are precedents on how 
public funding of major league development projects have happened in the past. From there, we'll we'll dive more deeply into that. Uh, a week later, we'll be in Paris and we'll be uh, 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 having a show from there. And then we have guests from the Cascade Institute on this very concept of polycrisis. We're not sure exactly where that will be. So last week, we had an interesting, speaking of literacy, an interesting uh, conversation with two Marshall McLuhan scholars on literacy and how that applies. Is, is AI a medium? And then uh, using uh, McLuhan, the, you know, the, the founder of modern media, that the basic principle of all media observation comes from the, the effect of putting one medium inside another. And so it gives the example of TV, uh, uh, that movies becoming content for TV elevated movies to an art form, which they'd been themselves common before that as a way to encapsulate live theater and so on. So now, unbelievably, the Internet has assimilated or contained TV. Never would have predicted that could be possible. And uh, so is TV now an art form? Well, it kind of seems like it is. We've had, you know, really extraordinary television programming. All right, next question then, the internet. It, the internet, is the internet become content of AI? I mean, it seems to be just everywhere their internet is or will be. And so now is that make, what does that do to the internet? Is, it, is the internet an art form? It doesn't seem like it. And certainly uh, Corey is making the point that it's uh, just almost the opposite. Uh, so to the point, Bezel, the title of the book that Corey is currently on tour for, taking time out to spend with us today to promote that this uh, interval between uh, the moment the, the confidence trickster knows that he's won and the, and, the, and the sucker, the victim, the mark, does not yet understand that he's lost it. So uh, that's the great economist, Gilbraith. So here we are to uh, to Corey and our our uh, presentation today. Thank you, Corey, for being back with us. We appreciate you taking out the time. We know you're extremely busy. You got I can't even. We don't have time for me to list all the things that you're doing. So uh, with that, uh, consider yourself introduced, reintroduced. Welcome back, and we hope you'll keep coming back because we find what you say so interesting and compelling. And we're anxious to hear what libraries can do to de disincentify the internet. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And it's so exciting to hear all the folks you're, uh, all the stuff you folks are, are getting up to. I know every writer who talks to a library audience uh, says some uh, platitudes about how much they love libraries, blah, blah, blah. But I, I want to say that I sincerely love libraries, blah, blah, blah. I'm a recovering uh, cataloger and page. Um, I worked with IFLA and IFL extensively at the World Intellectual Property Organization, where I was an NGO delegate uh, and helped with them to create the Access to Knowledge uh, Initiative, which became the Treaty of Marrakesh on the Rights of People with Disabilities to Access Copyrighted Works. Went on to help uh, uh, IFL and IFLA work with uh, African NGOs in East Africa to create something called Access to Information in Africa to negotiate um, electronic journal subscriptions and accreditation terms for African universities. Uh, and I am today a visiting faculty member at the University of North Carolina School of Library Science. So I am really a giant library stan, and it's very exciting to talk to you folks. And it's definitely, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm on my home turf here. So last year, I, I coined this term in shittification, and it's a way to describe how platforms decay. And that funny, obscene little word did some pretty big numbers. It, it hit the zeitgeist. The American Dialect Society made it the word of the year for 2023. And in the months since, I have managed to make my peace with the idea that I'm definitely getting a poop emoji on my headstone. <laughs> so I, I thought that today I would explain what inshitification is and try and, and explain why it is that people find the idea so compelling. So inshitification is my theory that explains how the internet came to be colonized by platforms. Uh, platforms are uh, two-sided markets where you have business customers on one side and end users on the other, and it's the endemic form of business on the internet, which is weird given that we were told that the future of the internet was disintermediation and a platform is a, an intermediary. 
So this theory explains how these intermediaries colonized the internet and how they started to degrade so quickly and so thoroughly and why that matters to us. And I think most importantly, what we can do about it. Because I put it to you that we are living through the Inshittocene, a kind of great Inshittening, in which these services that matter so much to us, that we rely on for so much, are all turning into giant piles of shit all at once. And this is frustrating at the best of times, but it can actually be quite demoralizing or even terrifying because of the role that these platforms have assumed in our daily lives. I think that my shitification framework goes a long way to explaining what's going on. And I think it moves us out of a mysterious realm in which the great forces of history have conspired to make things bad and into a material world in which named people made specific decisions. Because in that world, we can take it upon ourselves to reverse those decisions. And as to the people who took those decisions, we can uncover their names, we can uncover their addresses, and we could probably make a pretty shrewd estimation of what size pitchfork they take. So let's break down this inshittification idea. Uh, I uh, uh, use the metaphor, the very timely and, and zeitgeisty metaphor of a pandemic. Um, in a pandemic, first of all, you have the symptoms exhibited by the people who suffer from the pathogen. Uh, and then you have the underlying mechanism, the thing that's going on inside their bodies that causes the symptoms to be manifested. And then you have an epidemiology, right? An account of how it is that this sickness is spreading to so many places all at once. And then if you're lucky, you can propose a cure, a treatment. So let's start with those symptoms, what uh, a doctor would call the natural history of enchitification. If a company contracts enchitification, it undergoes a, a very characteristic and easily identified three-stage process of degeneration. In the first stage, that company is very good to its users. And then in the second stage, it abuses those users somewhat in order to make a hospitable environment for those business customers. And finally, it abuses those business customers, clawing back all the value from both end users and business customers to take all the value for itself, and then it dies. Or at least it turns into a giant pile of shit. And there is a case study that I'd like to use to illustrate this. I, I think the kind of poster child for this process is Facebook. Uh, Facebook is a company that had a very inauspicious beginning. It was started by Mark Zuckerberg so that he and his creepy friends at Harvard could uh, non-consensually rate the fuckability of their fellow undergrads. And actually it got worse after that inauspicious beginning. Uh, they raised venture capital and they expanded their operations beyond the US uh, college kids who were the only ones who were welcome on Facebook. In the early years of Facebook, you needed a, a .edu address to connect to Facebook. And they said, now this is open to anyone who wants to join up. And um, uh, they made a pitch to those people who were, uh, they were hoping to lure onto the platform. They said, you know, I, I understand that everyone who wants social media already has an account on the service MySpace, but has it occurred to you that that MySpace service is owned by an evil, crapulent, senescent Australian billionaire named Rupert Murdoch, and that he is spying on you with every hour that God sends? We have a counter proposal for you. If you come and sign up for Facebook, we will never, ever spy on you. We will do no commercial surveillance. All we ask of you is that you come to us and that you articulate your social graph. Tell us who matters to you in this world by listing who your friends are and how you're connected to them. And then we will compose a personal feed consisting solely of what those people post for consumption by those who choose to follow them. So that was stage one. Facebook has the surplus, the cash from its investors, and it allocates the surplus to those end users. And those end users, well, they locked themselves to Facebook. So Facebook, like most tech businesses, enjoys something economists call network effects. A network effect is, is said to be present in a product or service if it gets more valuable when more people use it. So you joined Facebook because there are some people there that you wanted to talk to. They made it valuable to you. And then other people joined Facebook because you were there. You made it more valuable still. But Facebook doesn't just have high network effects. It also enjoys something that economists call high switching costs. Now switching costs, the name, it, it, the name tells you everything. Switching costs are everything you give up when you leave a product or a service. So in Facebook's case, that's all those people that you signed up to hang out with, right? All the people who follow you and all the people you're following. In theory, all of those people could get together and they could agree, oh, we're all gonna leave Facebook on a certain day and we're gonna go somewhere else and we're gonna reestablish ourselves. But in practice, this is prevented by 
yet a third idea from economics, the collective action problem. The collective action problem is just a way of saying it's hard to get a lot of people to do the same thing. You know, you're in a group chat with six people and you can't even agree on what board game to play this Friday or what movie to see. Uh, this is much harder when it's you and 200 people on Facebook. And some of you are there because you know you have a rare disease and this is where your support group is. And some of you are there because you're part of a diaspora or you're an immigrant and the people in the country you left behind are only connected to you on Facebook. Some of you are there because that's where your kids little league game plans the carpool. And some of you are there because that's where your customers or your audience are. And so all of you coordinating to leave at a certain time also entails all of those other groups that you're there to hang out with coordinating to leave at a certain time and a certain threshold, it just becomes impossible to leave. So Facebook's end users engage in this mutual hostage taking and that glues them to the platform. Facebook senses that this has happened and they trigger the second stage of enshittification where they withdraw some surplus from end users and they allocate it to business customers. And there's two groups of business customers that Facebook is concerned with at this point. There's advertisers and publishers. For advertisers, Facebook makes this pitch. They say, do you remember, we told these rubes that we weren't gonna spy on them. That was a lie. We spy on them from asshole to appetite and we will sell you access to that surveillance data in the form of fine-grained advertising targeting that we will charge bottom dollar for. Not only that, we're such good-natured slobs that we have built an entire building and filled it with engineers who do nothing but police ad fraud. So those ads are dirt cheap to serve and they'll be delivered to the people that you asked us to serve them to. Give us a dollar for an ad to show to a person, that person will see that ad. Now to the publishers, Facebook went and they said, hey, do you remember we told these rubes that we were only gonna show them the things they asked to see? Also a lie. If you take stuff from your perfectly cromulent website where you have ways to make money off of users and you just pick, take an excerpt from your article and you add a link to go back to that website where you can make money however you choose to make money, we will take that excerpt and we will non-consensually cram it into the eyeballs of people who never ask to see it and you will get a free traffic funnel that will drive millions of users to your website. You can make money of them however you want. And so the advertisers, the publishers pile into the platform, they lock themselves in because they become dependent on those users. The users hold each other hostage. And then the fact that they are all held hostage takes hostage the publishers and the advertisers and everyone is locked in. So now it's time for stage three of enshittification. This is the stage in which Facebook starts to withdraw surplus from both groups and users and business customers, leaving behind just the homeopathic residue that they calculate will be sufficient to keep everyone locked to the platform. So if you're an end user, the quantum of material in your feed that you ask to see dwindles to a nearly imperceptible uh, 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 fraction, and it leaves behind this void that can be filled with things that people will pay to show you. Some of that is advertising, some of that is boosted content. But for the advertisers and publishers, it's no better. The advertisers find that their prices go way up. Ad targeting fidelity goes way down, so they pay more to reach audiences less effectively. And then the amount of ad fraud on these platforms explodes. It's hard to overstate just how bad it was and how bad it is. Procter & Gamble, for example, had a $100 million per year programmatic advertising spend. Programmatic advertising is the euphemism for surveillance advertising. Now they suspected that these ads weren't reaching the people that they were paying for. So they reduced that $100 million a year spend to zero. And zero is also the number of sales that uh, they lost as a result. Their sales remained static even after they zeroed out that $100 million spend. So to a first approximation, that $100 million just disappeared. None of the people that wanted to, to show those ads to saw the ads. For publishers, it also got worse. They found that they had to put longer and longer and longer excerpts on the site, not just have their content recommended, but have their content reach the people who'd subscribe to it after it was recommended to them. That meant that the material they put on Facebook became more and more substitutive for the material on their website. And so the traffic funnel dwindled and actually disappears altogether at a certain point because Facebook turns around and they say, you know, uh, if you put even a link to your website on this, uh, we can't be sure if it's a malicious link. So we're going to downrank that content. You just need to put the whole article up and no way to find it anywhere but Facebook. You need to become a commodity service provider to Facebook with your only path to monetization being that super corrupt advertising market. 
And those groups obviously didn't take this lying down. They got really angry and they complained, but Facebook had mastered the first lesson of the Darth Vader MBA. I have altered the deal. Pray I don't alter it further. Uh, and so uh, all of these companies are now locked to the platform and that signals the final stage of insinification, the most dangerous phase, when all of the surplus is withdrawn, just enough residual value is left to keep end users locked in and therefore business customers locked in, but every other extractable penny is being returned to shareholders and executives in the form of bonuses. But that is a very brittle equilibrium because the, G the difference between, oh my God, I hate this service, but I can't stop logging into it. And oh my God, I hate this service. I'm never coming back, it's razor thin. All it takes is a Cambridge Analytica scandal, a whistleblower, a live stream mass shooting, and users bolt for the exit. And then Facebook discovers that network effects are a double-edged sword, right? If you're staying there because there's someone there you can't bear to part with, then when that person leaves, there's no reason not to leave yourself. And that is terminal and shitification. That's the phase when the platform becomes a pile of shit. And that phase is accompanied by panic. But in Silicon Valley, they have a euphemism for panic, a technical term. They call it pivoting. And in Facebook's case, the pivot was... Yeah, I know. We told you. The future was that you were going to spend the rest of your life arguing with your racist uncle using this primitive text interface. But Mark Zuckerberg has had a revelation, and he's realized that the future is that he's going to transform you and everyone you love into a low polygon, heavily surveilled, legless, sexless cartoon character in a virtual world, world called the metaverse that we ripped off from a 25-year-old satirical dystopian cyberpunk novel. And that's the final stage of enshittification. The whole thing turns into a pile of shit. Now, that is the process of enshittification, the symptoms. If enshittification were a disease, it would be its natural history. But that doesn't tell you what's going on inside the body of the, of the uh, infected company, nor does it tell you why the infection is spreading. And without that, we can't know what to do about it. So let's talk about the mechanism. What's happening inside the corporate body that causes enshittification to be so easily accomplished? Well, it's because these are digital companies. And digital is different in that computers are very flexible. And so digital products also enjoy a, a, a deadly flexibility, right? The only computers we know how to build are these Turing complete universal von Neumann machines, computers that can run every program that is valid. And that means that services that are built on top of digital substrates can alter their business logic from moment to moment. They can twiddle an infinite number of knobs and levers on the back end to alter the payout, the costs, the rankings, and other elements of how the business works. So let's take another case uh, study here. Let's talk about Uber and how Uber prices its driver's labor. Every driver for Uber is offered a different wage for the same ride. And the major determinant of that wage is how choosy the Uber driver is. If a Uber driver has been selective and turned down a bunch of rides, they get offered more to do the same ride than an Uber driver who is less selective in which rides they're willing to take. You can think of these as a proxy for how independent a driver is of their Uber income. If you're taking even very low priced rides, you must really depend on Uber. And Uber's goal is to make you independent so they can lower your wage. And so what they do is they titer your wages up when you're selective. But as that wage reaches the threshold at which you'll accept it, on a random interval and at random increments, they start to lower that wage. Now, if you balk and you uh, uh, refuse to uh, continue to drive, they titer the wage up again. They're playing you like a fish on a line. And they don't have to be stronger than you, as with any fisherman. They just have to be tireless. They just have to exhaust you. And eventually, Uber drivers end up in a low-wage trap where they have been pushed into accepting a wage that's very low, but they've also jettisoned the other side hustles they had that let them be more selective in what they want. Now, this is not a unique insight, right? You don't have to be a modern genius to think that this is a great way to trap workers into low wages. You know, all those black-hearted coal bosses that Tennessee Ernie Ford wrote ballads about would have surely loved to have done this to their coal miners. The thing that hamstrung them wasn't their, you know, um, sociopathic imagination. It was that they could not build a boiler room big enough nor fill it with enough guys with green eye shades to adjust people's pay packet from moment to moment and second to second. Right? When you're playing a shell game, it's not the sophistication of the trick that fools someone. It's the quickness of the hand that deceives the eye. When you add a computer to a business, you end up with a shell game that has the very fastest hands. So this is something that happened with Facebook as well. When publishers said, oh, we're being asked to put 
uh, substitutive excerpts onto the website in order to reach your audience, they would sometimes balk and they would pull back from posting on Facebook. Well, Facebook's algorithm could reach into the archive material they had posted and just show it to 30 million people. And then the publisher gets a flood of traffic, a ton of ad revenue, and they say to themselves, I guess I'm better at this Facebook thing than I thought I was. And they're back in the game. Uh, so the flexibility of digital, that proliferation of knobs that platforms can touch whenever they feel like or automate altogether, that is the underlying mechanism. It becomes a system of pumps that can move value very quickly from end users to business customers, business customers to end users, both to shareholders or shareholders to both as is needed to bring people in and then drain them of value. That is the underlying mechanism of the disease. That is how the disease works. Well, this leaves us with one final question to answer about how this disease is working in our world. The epidemiology, the contagion that's turning everything into a pile of shit right now. What led to the inshittocene? What is it about this moment that created the great inshittening? Was it the end of the zero interest rate policy? Was it that these companies had heroic tech leaders that really cared about their products who retired and were replaced with bloodless bean counters? Or is it just that mercury is in retrograde? Well, I don't think it's any of those things. The, the period of free Fed money certainly gave tech companies a lot of surplus to play with, right? And that did supercharge their ability to do these, these shell games. But Facebook started in shitifying long before the zero interest rate policy ended. And so did Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Now it's true, some of these tech companies did get new leaders. But, you know, take Google, right? Their inshittification got much worse after the original Google boys came back to oversee their AI panic. I mean, their AI pivot. And I don't think it can be Mercury in retrograde because I am a cancer. And as everyone knows, cancers don't believe in astrology. So when a whole bunch of independent entities all start changing in the same way at once, it's a good bet that what's actually changing is not endogenous to those bodies. It's rather some exogenous environmental factor that is acting on those bodies. And that's what's happening with tech. Now, all companies, including tech companies, have a conflicting set of imperatives, right? They want to make as much money as possible, but making money involves hiring and motivating competent staff and making products that customers want to buy. And the more value that a company permits its employers, uh, employees rather, and its customers to carve off, the less value it has to return to its shareholders. So to get an equilibrium where companies produce things that we like in honorable ways at a fair price, we have to have a, a system where charging more, worsening quality, or harming workers costs the company more than it stands to make by playing dirty. Now, forces that discipline companies that stop them from playing dirty, there's four of them in the case of tech companies. Two of them are universal and two are, are specific to the tech firms uh, broadly. So the, the, the two forces that are universal and very well known, uh, the first is competition. Right? If a company fears it's going to lose your business, on balance, they'll treat you better. Right? And if they don't, if they don't learn that lesson, well, they're going to lose your business. Right? And either they'll learn, learn the lesson or they'll croak as a result. The second is regulation. Right? If a company uh, has a reasonable fear that a regulator is going to fine them more than they stand to make by cheating you, they'll cheat you less. And again, if they have too much hubris to uh, contain themselves, then when they cheat you, they'll get fined and all the benefits expected from cheating will be wiped out by the fines and then they'll go out of business. So that's every company in the world is, is uh, has to struggle in some way with competition and regulation. But tech companies have two more constraints that act on them that are, are unique and distinctive to tech. One is technical and the other one is social. The technical constraint is something I call self-help. Now, remember, computers are extremely flexible, and so are the products and services that we build on them because they're built on Turing complete universal von Neumann machines, computers that can run every valid program. And that means that there is always a program that a user could potentially avail themselves of that would disenshittify whatever the company had done to enshittify their product. So imagine we're all sat around a boardroom table and we're planning the advertising strategy for our website. And the guy leading the meeting says, hey, folks, as you know, our key performance indicator is gross revenue from advertising. And I've calculated that we can get an extra 2% in our uh, gross advertising revenue. All we need to do is make the advertising 20% more in invasive and obnoxious. And if we do that, everybody gets a great Christmas bonus. We all get to take our families to Switzerland this Christmas for a, for a ski holiday, right? So I say we do it. Well, someone at that boardroom table puts their hand up 
not because they care about a user's well-being. And they say, I love how you think, but has it occurred to you? If we make the ads 20% more invasive, 40% of our users are probably going to go to the search engine and they're going to type, how do I block ads? Right? And if they do that, the value for each of those users, it's not the current nominal 100%. It's not the 102% that you were hoping to get that gets us all that ski holiday. The value that we get out of each of those users falls to zero and it stays there forever because no user is going back to the search engine to type, how can I start seeing ads again? Right? And so this acts as a powerful disciplinary force on companies, the fact that computers are very digital, that you can install something that lets you jailbreak your printer or an alternative client that lets you view Facebook in a different way or that you can block ads. Now there's a fourth and final constraint on tech, and this is the one that's socially determinant. It's the tech workforce. Now the tech workforce is very weird uh, in its composition because uh, while it has extremely low union density, it has historically enjoyed an enormous amount of bargaining power. That's rare to see, and you only see it in firms where you have a, a protracted period, or in sectors rather, where you have a protracted period in which there is a long-term shortage of workers, right? And so um, this talent shortage led tech workers to conceive of themselves not as workers at all, Right? Tech workers basically saw themselves as temporarily embar embarrassed founders, right? Uh, uh, people who are really entrepreneurs who just find themselves drawing a salary at the moment. And that meant that they knew that they could always walk out of the company that they were working for, go across the street to another company and get a job that was just as good, if not better than the job that they had. They knew it. Their bosses knew it. And ironically, their bosses hit on a strategy that made them uniquely exploitable because this self-conception as a heroic figure of the tech mission means that if the company appeals to that mission with a slogan like don't be evil or make the world more open and connected that they can instill a sense of mission in the workers so some of you uh, may be familiar with the great librarian theorist uh, Fobazi Etar she identifies this idea vocational awe that's used to motivate people by appealing to their sense of mission uh, a lot of tech workers experienced it Although they knew it by other names, you know, Elon Musk calls it being extremely hardcore. And so these tech workers, they had all this bargaining power, which they flexed for wages, but not for um, hours. When their bosses demanded that they sacrifice their help, their families, their sleep uh, to meet their arbitrary deadlines, they just stepped up to do it. So long as their bosses were willing to transform the workplace into a whimsical campus where you got a gym, a gourmet cafeteria, laundry service, and even a surgeon who would remove and freeze your eggs so that you could work through your fertile years, you could tell yourself that you were actually being pampered and not worked like a government mule. For tech bosses, this worked very well, but it failed badly. There is a huge downside to motivating workers by appealing to their sense of mission, which is that your workers will have a sense of mission. And when you tell them that it's time to unshittify the products that they ruin their health to ship, they will experience a profound sense of moral injury, respond with outrage and threaten to quit. And since you can't replace them, you'll have to listen to them. And so tech workers were themselves the final bulwark against unshittification. The era before unshittification was not a time where we had better leaders. Those leaders weren't better. They were constrained. Their worst impulses were checked by competition, by regulation, by self-help, and by worker power. And what happened is that one by one, each of those constraints was eroded until it dissolved. And that unshittificatory impulse of their bosses was left unchecked, and it ushered in the unshittocene. So the destruction of those, of those constraints started with the drawing down of competition. From the Gilded Age until the Reagan years, the purpose of American competition law was, as it says on the tin, to promote competition. US antitrust law treated corporate power as dangerous per se, as a threat to democracy, and sought to keep it at bay. But starting in the neoliberal era with Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan, competition authorities in the US and then all over the world adopted a new doctrine they called consumer welfare. And in consumer welfare conceptions of competition, a monopoly is not evidence of cheating, it's an evidence of quality. If everyone in the world is shopping at one store and when they get there, they all buy the same product, that means that someone has built the best store and filled it with the best product. It doesn't mean that anyone is cheating. And so when the world's government, and so the world's governments, they stopped enforcing competition law. They just ignored antitrust violations when companies flouted it. And so these companies were able to flout the law. 
they merged with their major competitors. They absorbed smaller companies before they could grow to become big threats. They engaged in an orgy of consolidation that produced the most inbred sectors imaginable. Whole industries grown so incestuous that they had the corporate equivalent of a Habsburg jaw. From eyeglasses to sea freight, from glass bottles to payment processing, from vitamin C to beer, most of our global economy is dominated by five or fewer global uh, companies. Now, sometimes smaller companies didn't want to sell to these big companies, but again, because they didn't have to worry about competition law, they could do predatory pricing, another thing that the law bans, but that in practice we permitted. This happened in the early days of Amazon, when Amazon was consolidating its e-commerce wins by buying other e-commerce companies and absorbing them. One of those companies was called Diapers.com, no points for guessing what they sold. Amazon wanted to buy Diapers.com, but Diapers.com had a great business and they didn't want to sell. So Amazon took $100 million from the capital markets and they set it on fire. They sold diapers significantly below cost so that Diapers.com went bankrupt. They bought Diapers.com at pennies on the dollar and then they liquidated it. So this was not just a way to keep diapers.com from competing with them. This was a lesson to everyone who might start or fund a rival e-commerce platform that you better not do anything that would ever compete with Amazon. And if Amazon ever tries to buy the company, you better sell. Competition became a distant memory. Tom Eastman, the great software developer from New Zealand, says the web has devolved into five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four. And giant companies no longer fear losing our business to their competitors. You'll remember when Lily Tomlin used to do this recurring bit on Saturday Night Live where she'd play Ernestine, the AT&T operator, doing commercials for Ma Bell. And at the end of every one of these commercials, she'd turn to the camera and she'd say, we don't care, we don't have to, we're the phone company. Today's tech giants, they're not constrained by competition. They don't care, they don't have to. They're Google and they have 90% of the search market. So that was the first constraint gone. And when it slipped away, that second constraint, regulation, was also doomed. Because when an industry consists of hundreds of small and medium-sized companies, it is a mob, it's a rabble, hundreds of companies, they have the same collective action problem that you and your friends in the group chat have, that not only can they not agree on what their lobbying position is, they can't agree on where to hold an annual conference to discuss a lobbying position. But when the sector dwindles to a bare handful of cozy, dominant firms, it's not a rabble anymore, it's a cartel. Five companies, four companies, three companies, two companies, just one company finds it easy to converge on one message for their regulators. And because they don't have wasteful competition, they don't have their profits eroded and they have a lot of cash to spread around. And so tech's regulatory capture allowed it to flout the rules that less concentrated sectors were constrained by. Tech was allowed to violate our labor, consumer and privacy rights and say, it's fine, we did it with an app. Now that's why competition matters. It's not just that competition uh, makes companies work harder and share value with their customers and their workers. It's because competition com be makes companies from becoming too big to fail and too big to jail. After all, there's lots of things we don't want companies to improve by sharpening them with competition, right? Like take commercial surveillance. It would be very perverse to use competition to pit companies against one another to see which one can become most efficient in spying on us. We don't want companies to become better at violating our human rights. When companies harm us, we don't want them to compete to get better at harming us, but we do want regulators to be able to step in and extinguish that harmful conduct. And the more concentrated a sector is, the harder it is for regulators to, to hold it in check. Instead, the companies that dominate the sector also come to dominate their regulators and they ignore the harms they inflict. So with privacy, we have Google and Facebook acting as though they don't have to obey privacy law because they violate the law with an app. And we have Uber able to violate labor law. They say that it doesn't matter because they do it with an app. And we have Amazon violating our consumer protection laws saying it doesn't matter because they do it with an app. You know, Amazon has this thing. It's a $38 billion a year sub-business they call an advertising system. And I use the sarcastic finger quotes here because they're not selling ads. What Amazon sells is the right for things that don't match your search query to be highly ranked in the search results when you search on Amazon. When you search Amazon, the first result that comes up is on average 29% more expensive than the best deal, the best match for your search. That first row, the first four items, 25% more expensive than the best match for your query. On average, to get the best match for your query, you have to go down 17 places in an Amazon search result. 
If you walked into a store and said, sell me your cheapest Duracell batteries, and instead they turned around and sold you name, uh, house uh, brand batteries that cost 30% more than Duracells, your attorney general would step in and find them, and if they didn't stop, they'd shut them down. But Amazon says, it's not a consumer rights violation. It's not fraud. We did it with an app. Now, if your attorney general won't act here, if your regulator won't act here, it would be sure nice if you could act to help yourself. And this is where those self-help apps would sure come in handy, right? If um, you know, Google and Amazon and, and Facebook are violating your privacy rights and the government won't step in, well, you could just install an ad blocker. More than half of all internet users are blocking ads and in so doing protecting their privacy. It's the largest consumer boycott in world history. But the web is an open platform. It comes from an age in which tech was made up of hundreds of companies at each other's throats who hadn't captured their regulators. And the, the web is being supplanted by apps. Apps are the product of a monopolistic duopoly, two companies that run our mobile ecosystem, and those apps are designed for enshittification. Because after all, regulatory capture, it's not just the right to uh, flout regulation, it's also the right to wield regulation, to co-opt your regulators and send them after your competitors to shut them down. Now, the self-help measures that you might take advantage of, they're familiar to the tech giants. The tech giants got big by exploiting them. You know, back when Facebook was telling people, hey, leave MySpace and come to Facebook, we're not an evil Australian billionaire's uh, playground, the, the pitch didn't end there. They didn't say, hey, we got a better privacy policy, so why don't you come and just reread that policy until your foolish friends get tired of MySpace and come join you here on Facebook. They gave those users a bot. And if you gave the bot your username and your password, it would go to MySpace several times a day and it would scrape all of the messages waiting for you, having logged in as you, bring them back, push them into your Facebook inbox. You could reply to them and then it would push them back out to MySpace. Um, but every pirate wants to be an admiral. When Facebook and Apple and Google did this kind of adversarial interoperability, reverse engineering other people's products and modifying them, that was progress. But if you do it to them, that's piracy. If you try to make an alternative client for Facebook, they'll say you violated the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. If you try to make an Android program to run your iPhone apps and play back the data that you've bought from Apple's media stores, they'll bomb you till the rubble bounces. Try to scrape all of Google, they'll nuke you until you glow. Right? There's no end to the degree of regulatory capture that tech enjoys. You know, as librarians, you're probably familiar with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Bill Clinton signed it into law in 1998, and it contains this pernicious section, Section 1201, that constitutes a blanket prohibition on uh, breaking any of the encryption, weakening any of the encryption that stops you from using the, a copyrighted work as you see fit, including within the realm of law. And the penalties for violating Section 1201 of the DMC are very stiff. It's a $500,000 fine and a five-year prison sentence for a first offense. And the tech companies have broadened this law in, uh, to the point now where it could be actually used to imprison creators for granting their audiences access to works that they paid for. So here's an example of how that can work. Back in 2008, regulators allowed Amazon to make an anti-competitive acquisition. They bought Audible, which was at the time the leading audiobook platform and today is the monopoly platform with more than 90% market share. And Audible, under, manage, uh, under management by Amazon, requires everyone who sells an audiobook on the platform to allow Amazon to put its digital rights management on it, to encrypt it so that it only plays back on an Amazon app. So if I, as a writer, write a book, which I do with alarming regularity, and then I go into a studio and I record the audiobook, which I've been known to do every now and again, and I pay the director, I pay an engineer, we make a high quality audiobook, we sell it to you on Audible for $17. And then later on, I decide, I don't like the deal Audible is giving me, I'm going to sell my book somewhere else, I'm going to withdraw them from Audible, and I'm going to give my uh, listeners a tool so that they can just migrate their collections to that other platform so they can follow me there. I can't do that. Providing such a tool is a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine, even if that tool is only used to unlock the books that I made and then paid to adapt into an audiobook and that you bought from me via this intermediary. That is a stiffer penalty than you would face if you just went to a torrent site and downloaded my audiobook. It's a stiffer penalty than you would face if you found a truck stop where they were selling it on CD and you shoplifted it. It's also a stiffer penalty than you would face if you found the truck that delivered the CD and held up the driver and stole the truck. So think back to those ad blockers again. We're in our product planning meeting. We've decided we're not gonna make the ads on the website more obnoxious because we're worried about users installing an ad blocker. So person leading the meeting says, well, I've also been thinking that we can make the ads in our app 
more obnoxious. Uh, if we make those 20% more obnoxious, we get 2% more from the app. Maybe that'll get us the ski holiday. And looks expectantly over at the Killjoy who said, no, we can't do that for the website. And the Killjoy says, you're right, I do object to this plan because it's not ambitious enough. We should make the ads 100% more obnoxious, get 10% more revenue. Everybody gets a, a speedboat as well as a French ski holiday because we don't care if the users go to the search engine and type, how do I block ads in this app? Because the answer is, you can't. Um, so there's th that means that companies are no longer facing this constraint that comes from self-help. Likewise, if you're a gig worker and algorithmic wage discrimination is eroding your pay, you and your colleagues within the gig work workforce could install a counter app that rejects all offers automatically across a pool of workers unless the offer reaches a certain threshold. You don't have to use your uh, weak, tire, easily tired human brain to, to resist algorithmic wage discrimination. You can just write an app that goes back and, and resists it. But the toolsmith who makes you that tool um, would go broke or land in prison for violating the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, trademark copyright, patent, trade secrecy, non-disclosure, and non-compete, all that stuff that we call IP law. And, you know, IP is like this controversial term, but in this context, you can see that IP is just a corporate euphemism for any law that allows the company to reach beyond its four walls and control the conduct of its critics, its competitors, and its customers, while app is just a corporate euphemism for any web page you wrap in enough IP to make it a felony to mod the app to protect the labor, consumer, and privacy rights of its users. They don't care. They don't have to. They are the mobile phone duopoly. And what happened to the fourth constraint? What happened to our workers? Well, for decades, tech workers' high degrees of bargaining power and their vocational awe put a ceiling on inshittification. Even after the tech sector shrank to a handful of giants, even after they captured their regulators so they could violate our consumer privacy and labor rights, even after they created this felony contempt of business model IP regime that extinguished self-help for tech users, the workers themselves and their sense of moral injury in the face of the imperative to inshittify still constrained their bosses. They were the last line of defense, and that line has crumbled. Uh, all that's left is work for a tech giant until they fire your ass, right? Those 12,000 Googlers who got fired last year, six months after a stock buyback of $80 billion that would have paid their salaries for the next 27 years, they're not telling their bosses, I refuse to inshittify this. The response to I refuse to make this product worse today is turn in your badge, those cool digital badges, they're expensive, and then don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. So today we have the same executives with the same impulses, taking the same tactics to extract value from their platforms to make by making things worse for their business customers and their end users, but they are not constrained by competition, by regulation, by self-help or by labor. They apply the same amount of force to that and should lever that they've been yanking on every day when they come to work since the year dot, but now it moves. So this can be a little depressing, but hear me out. We have now identified the disease. We've traced its natural history. We can spot its symptoms, how they lock in users and then business customers and then transfer value, value from both to themselves. We know how that happens. The intrinsic flexibility of digital platforms is a pump for moving value around. And we've unraveled its epidemiology, the collapse of the constraints that used to prevent enshittification from taking root in most firms. But when a firm did contract enshittification, it would succumb to the disease. And, and collapse and be supplanted by a superior competitor. It didn't shamble on tormenting users and business customers long after the day after it should have been shot in the head and put in the ground. So now that we understand the disease, we can think about what the cure is. And if the four constraints that prevent enshittification are competition, regulation, self-help, and labor, then that's the things that we need to rebuild and strengthen to prevent enshittification from coming back, to, for, to roll it back as a, as, uh, from where it is today. Now, competition is actually going pretty good. The US, the UK, Europe, uh, Canada, Australia, Japan, e even China are all doing more on competition right now than they've done in generations. They're blocking mergers, they're unwinding existing ones, they're taking action on predatory pricing and sleazy tactics because they already have the laws to do so. They just stopped enforcing them in the Reagan era. Now, the beneficiaries of enshittification don't take this lying down. The business press can't stop talking about how stupid and old fashioned this stuff is. They brand people like me, hipster antitrust. And well, any regulator who's willing to do their job, they just hate. You know, Lena Kahn is this brilliant head of the US uh, Federal Trade Commission, the youngest person to ever head up the most powerful consumer regulator in the world. She's done more in three years on antitrust than the combined efforts of all of her predecessors over the last 40 years. 
And the Wall Street Journal, Rupert Murdoch's paper of record, has run more than 100 editorials condemning her for getting nothing done. Now, I promise you, Rupert Murdoch does not pay his editorial board to write 100 editorials about someone who's not getting anything done. Competition still has a long way to go, but all over the world, competition law is seeing a huge revitalization. Sure, it, antitrust law was put in a coma by Reagan and Thatcher, but it's awake, it's back, and it's pissed. Now, regulation, we're starting to figure out how to stop tech companies from doing that one weird trick of adding with an app to their crimes and getting away with it. In Europe, the new Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act have a novel enforcement mechanism. Rather than delegating enforcement to the national um, uh, courts or regulators of the country of domicile of the company, they're starting off uh, enforcement in the, the federal courts, the federal European courts. So for years, all the tech companies have flown this Irish flag of convenience. Ireland is a tax haven and tax havens are crime havens. Uh, any country that's mobile enough to pretend to be Irish this week could pretend to be Luxembourgian or Maltese or Cypriot next week. So Ireland understands that its privacy regulator better just never show up for work if they want to keep these companies domiciled there. And that's how we've gone so long in Europe with a very strong privacy law and very weak enforcement. In, in uh, Europe, they're actually figuring this out and starting enforcement federally. Now here in the United States, we might finally get a new digital consumer privacy law. The US has not had a new federal consumer privacy law since 1988, since the passage of the Video Privacy Protection Act that makes it a crime for video store clerks to tell the newspapers what VHS cassettes you take home. That's the last time we updated consumer privacy law, 1988. It has been a minute. And there are a lot of people who are angry about the stuff that goes on that has some nexus with America's poor privacy landscape. Maybe you're worried that Facebook made your grampy into a QAnon or that Insta made your teen anorexic or that TikTok brainwashed millennials into quoting Osama bin Laden. Or maybe you're worried that cops roll up the identity of everyone at a BLM demonstration or the January 6 riots by getting their location data from Google, or that red state attorneys general follow teenagers across state lines into abortion clinics, or that black people get discriminated against through online lending or hiring platforms, or maybe, you know, someone's making AI deepfake porn of you. A federal privacy law with a private right of action that let us sue, even if the prosecutors didn't want to take the case, will go a long way to rectifying those problems. And that constitutes a very big coalition for privacy law, which is why we're seeing more action on privacy now than we have in years. Now, on self-help, things are a little further away. Europe's Digital Markets Act does require the platforms under limited circumstances to allow interoperators to stand up gateways that allow people to plug in compatible systems. And that's going to help some. But if you want to do something that the DMA doesn't contemplate, Europe's got nothing for you. Uh, in the United States, we're starting to see some pretty interesting self-help stuff through right to repair. Oregon just passed a law that bans companies from using IP measures that would prevent rever reverse engineering, at least for repair. And there's something pretty on brand here between Europe and the US where Europe says to the companies, here's what you must do. And America says, you just don't get to use the courts to stop other people from doing stuff to you. It's a kind of a YOLO, God save America approach. And you know, the two are very complementary because if someone doesn't wanna use the European mandatory gateway, and instead chooses to do the guerrilla warfare of the American approach, it probably tells you the European mandatory gateway could use a, another look because it's not useful enough. And you know, this self-help stuff, I think it's gonna, it's gonna happen because as Stein's law goes, anything that can't go on forever eventually has to stop. Um, after years of being sabotaged uh, by companies that can control how we use our products, we're just getting fed up. It is just offensive that H HP has a whole building full of engineers who do nothing but try to figure out how way new ways to make you miserable and force you to spend $10,000 a gallon on ink to print out your boarding cards and your shopping lists. The only people who don't agree with this stuff are the people running monopolies in other industries who want to do this to, to their products, like med tech monopolists who lock insulin pumps to glucose monitors in the hopes of turning people with diabetes into walking uh, inkjet printers. And then finally, the constraint that we had that, that we need to bring back is labor. And labor is also looking pretty good. We have had a massive surge in tech uh, unions. Tech workers are realizing they're not just founders and waiting. The days of tech workers getting free massages and being able to show up for work with facial piercings, green hair, and a black t-shirt that says something their boss doesn't understand, they're coming to an end. 
In, in, in Seattle, Amazon's tech workers walked out with the warehouse workers, realizing that they are all workers. And the only reason those tech workers aren't being monitored by AI that notifies your boss if you pee too often is because you have rapidly dwindling bargaining power. The way things are going, Amazon tech workers will join Amazon warehouse workers in peeing in a bottle next to their workplace. And you know, as a sidebar here, let's contemplate how as a guy who built a penis-shaped rocket, Jeff Bezos has a weird antipathy towards our kidneys. So we are seeing uh, bold global action on competition, regulation, and labor with some action on self-help as well. And it's not a moment too soon because there is some bad news here, which is that inshittification comes to every industry. Once you put a network computer in your product, the people who made it can run that Darth Vader MBA playbook on it. They can change the rules from moment to moment, violate your rights and say, it's okay, we did it with an app. Mercedes is now renting you the accelerator pedal in your car by the month. There are Internet of Things dishwashers that require that you use proprietary dish soap. And shittification metastasizes into every corner of our lives. Software doesn't eat the world, it enshittifies it. Train your attention on the other end of the alimentary canal. But the bright side of this is that once everyone is threatened by enshittification, everyone has a stake in enshittification. Just like with the Privacy Law Coalition, the potential anti enshittification coalition is unstoppable. And it includes libraries. After all, you are dealing with the consequences of mass uh, market concentration and the ensuing regulatory capture. You can't buy an ebook, you can only rent it. That's classic twiddling. They can change the terms of your ebook from moment to moment and second to second. Once I sell you a book, I can't change the rules. The book is yours and copyright law constrains you, not 20,000 words of garbage legalese in a user agreement. You see the uh, cartel of publishers going after the Internet Archive and threatening the very idea of controlled digital lending so that you can't take the self-help measure of scanning the book and digitizing it, and you must take the offer that they have for the licensed ebooks. And then you have the private equity acquisition and consolidation of the tool suite you use. So KKR buying Overdrive being the most uh, uh, important example. Now, cynics among you may be skeptical that caring about enshittification or reversing it will make a difference, that enshittification is maybe just a euphemism for capitalism. I don't think it is. Look, I'm not going to cape for capitalism here. I am not a true believer in markets as the most efficient allocator of resources or arbiters of policies. If there was ever any doubt that that was the case, then surely capitalism's total failure to grapple with the existential climate emergency has erased it. But 20 years ago, we had a capitalism that made space for the wild and woolly internet, a space where people with disfavored views could find one another, offer mutual aid and organize, and organize. Whereas today's new capitalism has produced a global digital ghost mall filled with bot shit, crap gadgets from companies whose names are all consonants and cryptocurrency scams. The internet is not more important than climate emergency. It's not more important than gender justice, racial justice, inequality, and it's certainly not more important than stopping genocide. But the internet is the terrain on which we will fight those fights. Without a free, fair, and open internet, the fight is lost before it's joined. We can reverse the enshittification of the internet. We can halt its creeping enshittification into every digital device and build a new, better, enshittification-resistant digital nervous system fit to coordinate the mass movements we'll need to fight fascism and genocide and save our planet and our species. There is nothing about that struggle for a better world that is improved by making the lives of marginalized people worse, as in shittification does. We have everything to gain in those struggles by making their lives better. Martin Luther King said, the law can't make a man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me. And that's important. And it's true, the law can't force the corporate sociopath with their hand on the enshittification lever to conceive of you as a human being entitled to dignity and fair treatment, and not as an ambulatory wallet, a food source for that immortal colony organism we call a limited liability corporation. But it can make that executive treat you fairly and afford you with dignity, even though he doesn't think you deserve it. And I think that's pretty important. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Corey. Uh, knockout, a knockout. Uh, Thank you. Man, a, a list of questions that would take another hour just to read and, and or just to prioritize. So a uh, couple of things. One, just, you know, fantastic uh, encapsulation of a of a, a global circumstance and and uh, a way out or, or at least a partially a response to it. Uh, one of the one of the barriers that you mentioned was the collective user problem, 
-hmm. So do you see that AI could be a, a medium for users to collectively act? I mean, I realize we have to get it from someone who may mm. be the companies you're talking about, but could, for example, a public service provide that? I mean, it wouldn't take a lot for people to sign on to well, help me coordinate, you know, with everybody. I'm skeptical. I, you know, I'm I'm not a big AI booster. I think the claims that I've seen tend to be overblown. And in fact, there's a kind of pattern with AI, which is um, all the most impressive stuff seems to happen in domains that very few of us understand well enough to assess those claims. So, for example, Google said, "Oh, we, we our DeepMind has found uh, millions of new materials. It's an 800-year advance on on the science. Um, it, it, uh, it, you know, it's two orders of magnitude more." Uh, materials than had previously been known to us. So some material scientists started to do like uh, representative samples of these new materials, and they found zero, zero materials that were novel and useful. The vast majority of materials they found, again, zero, could only operate at absolute zero. <laughs> So, you know, these are not these are not useful materials. And then when you see the stuff where they claim, oh, can do stuff that you're familiar with and you look at it like, um, you know, writing, for example, it just it just isn't good. Right. And so I, I'm not convinced. I think that, you know, digital tools do help us overcome collective action problems. You know, you think about Wikipedia and the way that it allows large groups of people to coordinate efforts to build an encyclopedia. And people look at that process and then they go, oh, look at how onerous it is. Look at all these arguments. But, you know, it's like we have replaced top down management that required a huge, uh, extremely cumbersome, slow moving institution with te you know collective self-determination with deliberation and those deliberation tools keep finding new ways to get better you know one of the things that i think is really exciting about collective action is something we see with um, kickstarter and other crowd funder platforms which are threshold pre-commitment systems where you say i promise that i will act once a certain number of other people also agree to act um, because individual action doesn't do very much. I mean, you know, this is the problem with neoliberalism is it spent decades teaching us that like, if you don't like the way a company acts, you should just buy different products, right? You vote with your wallet. And, you know, boycotts can do something, you know, obviously um, boycott divest sanction had a huge impact on, on South Africa, but it was coordinated by like millions of people all around the world. Uh, it took a big effort. Um, if you say I will boycott these companies' products, or I will do something like um, stop buying overdrive and, and use a consortium product developed by, say, New York Public Library in co coalition with other libraries. They have a, a lot of cool digital e lending tools. Once, you know, 50 library systems have signed on and agreed to commit the same budget that they're spending on overdrive to the ongoing maintenance of this system and its improvement and support, then you can actually resolve these collective action problems. And I don't think you need AI for it. Yeah, good. I, I hope we don't. Uh, uh, the the other one is, uh, you know, these other industries. You gave me good examples of, of traditional industries, all now being totally reliant on the internet to operate. And so they're all internet companies. We're all internet people now, pretty much. Um, mm -hmm. How about Wall Street? How about where we put our money? Are we being shitified by the very people we're giving our money to to take care of us for our life savings? Are they? Well, yeah, I'm like, so look, I'm happy to have shitification used in loose and colloquial ways to mean things get worse or or things get worse in certain ways. And, and certainly uh, I think Wall Street has done that. You know, the rise and rise of managed funds, for example, is uh, an example of... Um, how firms that uh, lose your money can make more money than firms that make your money grow. And certainly the propensity for institutional funds like pensions and, and insurance funds to invest in things that are actually bad for the world. You know, insurance companies <laughs> invest very heavily in uh, fossil fuels, right? This is amazing, right? <laughs> because they're on the hook for climate change. Uh, and so there, it's, this, is like them, this is like buying arson futures or something. Uh, and, you know, my parents are, are uh, Ontario school teachers and their pension fund. God, they're the sucker at every table. They gave Sam Bankman fried $90 million. Uh, they also at one point invested very heavily in Canada's national right wing newspaper chain, whose uh, major cause is abolishing teachers unions. There is something very weird when your union is, is profiting from, you know, uh, 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 far right propaganda against your own union. 
Um, and, you know, there's plenty of retirees whose pension funds are invested heavily in um, uh, funds that are buying up single family dwellings and turning them into rental properties where the rents are jacked up and eviction is happening at a rate that never been seen in America. And so, you know, when you lose your house to the company that uh, you've invested in with your pension, that's a very cruel irony. And, and certainly some of the same forces are at work there, right? These companies are too big to fail. They're too big to jail. They're too big to care. They're opaque. Digital um, platforms allow uh, them to uh, play a quite an elaborate shell game. We saw this with um, the uh, meme stock rallies uh, where a lot of what, what was going on there was you had these esoteric financial arrangements where you had um, private equity funds that were... Um, uh, that were doing things, they were front running the transactions, so they paid for order flow, which means that they got to see the orders before the orders went through. And so if they saw that a bunch of people were ordering a stock, they could buy the stock first and then sell it to those people on an inflated price. That's how Robinhood was free, is they, they sold order flow to um, private equity funds that then uh, um, interposed themselves in the trades. Uh, and so this was a real heads, heads we win, tails uh, you lose kind of arrangement. Um, and, uh, and, and so certainly there's aspects of unshittification. I don't know that it's quite the same thing. For one thing, I don't think the, um, finance sector ever did have employees who really cared about this stuff and acted as a, as a, uh, bulwark against their unethical behavior. I think finance has historically built, been filled with people who are well on board with it. I mean, we've seen this since the savings and loan crisis, at least. Well, it's, it's a business of just about money. It's not about you know, making something, it's about sure. making money on yeah. something, somebody else's something. And so the motivation is built in, it seems like. Yeah, um, um, Douglas Rushkoff calls this going meta. He says that, you know, better than like driving a taxi is owning a taxi medallion. Better than owning a taxi medallion is uh, uh, making an app for taxi hailing. Better than making an app for taxi hailing is investing in an app for taxi hailing. Better than investing in the app is buying uh, options on it. Better than buying the options is buying derivatives of the options, right? The further away you can get is uh, that the from actual productive work, the more insulated you are from uh, any kind of... Um, uh, shock or risk, right? The more you play heads, I win tails, you lose. Uh, maybe a last question. We've, we're kind of run over time a little bit here, but you know, we're not a TV show, so it's not exactly a problem right. other than it may impinge on your time. Um, uh, the, the regulatory environment, uh, you mentioned the great work of the, of the FTC coming out, I mean, it's really something unexpected as well. Uh, at the internet governance forum a few years back, uh, in Paris, uh, the president of France came out and said, to us, it appears there are two versions of the internet. There's the Silicon Valley version and there's the Chinese version. And we're not really, we don't really like either one of those. And then the, the president of Orange, the telecom giant of France, uh, came out and said, uh, the, Europe, none of the top 10 internet companies, ventures, uh, are European. They're all Chinese or American. Mm -hmm. What Europe is good at is regulation. And so do you think that they really will be able to lead in regulation? I mean, do you expect either the the controlled environment of, of the CCP to, I mean, where's their self-interest in competition? Isn't their self-interest in protecting their power against the, a giant, you know, corporation? And, and for well, the I, U.S.? I, you know, I mean, I think... Yeah, I mean, we've heard this claim about China from the tech companies themselves. It's yeah, funny to yeah. hear to hear this talking point that originates really with Facebook and actually with a specific person at Facebook. This is the talking point of Nick Clegg, the odious ex-deputy prime minister of the United Kingdom, who now gets $4 million a year from Meta to shop around this idea that uh, if you make Facebook weaker, you will uh, allow the Chinese takeover of European cyberspace. Uh, he's he's really a, uh, just one of the worst people in the world. Uh, and this is his talking point. And I think that Macron is carrying water for him here at IGF. Um, I, I think that there is a, 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 a way to understand the regulatory environment in Europe that does make it um, more hospitable to effective tech regulation than the American system. And it's not because Europeans are more competent at regulating. Uh, Look, I, I, I'm not an anti-regulatory zealot by any stretch, 
But I did spend, you know, a decade as the European director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And a lot of that time I spent in Brussels talking to them about regulation. Europe has passed some absolutely bonkers, terrible regulation, including and especially tech regulation like the 2019 Digital Single Markets Directive that requires every platform to operate a copyright filter and block any user generated content that appears to violate anyone's copyright with no human in the loop. Right. This is this is just an extraordinarily bad policy, not least because it adds a, like a two to three hundred million euro capital moat around starting a competing business. Right. If you want to know why there's no European Facebook, you could start with the fact that you need to spend 300 million euros complying with the digital single markets directive and building your copyright filter. Right. Uh, however, in America, uh, they protect their tech giants. Right. Uh, there is a constituency for the tech giants in America uh and a, a, a legislative constituency for them that is not present to the same degree in europe europe does have a degree of of regulatory capture by the tech sector but to the extent that europe was ever captured by tech companies it was captured by the so-called national champions uh, nokia and uh, um, um, what was the italian one called uh Oh, the typewriter people, Olivetti and Deutsche Telekom and, and France Telecom, which is which is orange uh, and so on. Uh, and, you know, to a large extent, those companies, because Europe had weak competition enforcement, they just let Americans buy them. Most of those companies are divisions of American companies now. Um, China is also quite hostile to its tech companies. This is the funny thing about Clegg's argument is that um, far from treating uh, tech giants in China as uh, you know, projections of Chinese soft power abroad, Xi Jinping treats them as rivals for power within China. And he has been systematically scooping up and, and sticking in gulags the leaders of those companies. Now, I don't want anyone in a gulag, but I think if you're Nick Clegg and you're like, oh, actually those Chinese tech giants are just a projection of the CCP, you have to explain why this CCP is throwing their leaders in gulags, right? As opposed to like having them around for cocktails. Um, so, uh, I, I do think that like there is space in Europe to make rules, not that Europe has more competence in making the rules, but it has more space to make the rules relative to the United States. You know, last year we had three really good tech antitrust bills that Chuck Schumer personally killed. They just they just never got to the floor after he promised they would. He stabbed uh, the senators who he uh, traded with in the back on this and actually opened a riff in the Democratic caucus that is... Um, been slow to heal and, and has sown some democratic disunity. So there's just there's just more more high ranking legislators who will carry water for American tech companies, and even the ones who are good are bad selectively. You know you have um, Zoe, Zoe uh, Lofgren who's very good except when it really strikes the bottom line and then is quite unpredictable. Yeah. Well, you make a good point about about policy in this domain. It's one thing to make policy about Medicare, you know, public policy is what I'm talking about. There's a gap between public policy for tech, which is just indecipherable to the public. I mean, what are you talking about? This makes no sense to me whatsoever. I can, I can, I can barely change the ink cartridge of my printer. And now you're telling me I should mm -hmm. have an opinion about what you're talking about. So we rely on what the apparent integrity of our representatives and the system that they're operating in to to actually do the investigation to understand this stuff at a technical level and in the implications of it. That's a big lift. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's it all runs very quietly then. Yeah, it's true in every expert regulatory domain. And, you know, this is an area where monopoly really interferes with sound policymaking because policymaking is a truth seeking exercise. You mm -hmm. solicit comments from industry, from civil society, from the public about the best way to technically manage a difficult technical question. So, you know, one that I think strikes to your members' interests is um, uh, uh, net neutrality, right? So the FCC says, some people say net neutrality uh, makes network management impossible. Some people says it, it doesn't. What's true? And they invite comment. And because we have a handful of giant telecoms companies that have divided up the country like the Pope dividing up the new world and that don't compete with each other and that have converged on a single set of policies, what you get is them showing up and saying, it is technically impossible to run a neutral ISP. And then you get, you know, regional ISPs, mom and pop ISPs, uh, activists, uh, you know, community WISPs, small muni uh, fiber networks and so on saying, no, 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 it's possible. 
Uh, and the regulator, you know, in the reply comments, hears back from those big, the, those big cable giants saying, oh, sure, they say it's possible because they've got, you know, two orders of magnitude fewer subscribers than we do. Wait till they manage a big network and then they'll understand that it's impossible. If there were 100 companies vying for your internet business, the ones who are willing to tell the convenient lie that net neutrality is a technical impossibility would be countered by others who thought that they could win your business by offering you a neutral internet connection and you would have a much better evidentiary basis for sound net neutrality rules carry this over into every domain you know when west virginia what we think of west virginia is coal country it's actually chemical processing country it's, it's the biggest uh, industry in the state and it's dominated by one company dow chemical and they held a proceeding around 2017 to ask whether they should grant a local variance for um, uh, more runoff from chemical processing in the drinking water. Uh, and, you know, that's a technical question with a with a technical answer, like the amount of of runoff from chemical processing in the drinking water that is safe. It's not it's not zero. Right. There's there's definitely like an amount that's the right amount. And as someone who like has a polymer artificial hip, I don't want all chemical processing to stop. Right. So I, I'm interested in a sound answer to that question. But the answer to that question that was provided by by Dow in the form of its industry association, which it dominates the biggest biggest player in, was West Virginians can tolerate more poison in their drinking water than the national average, because the national average is calculated on the national average BMI. And here in West Virginia, they're fat. And so they can absorb more uh, poison in their bodies without getting sick. And also, on average, West Virginians drink more beer than other people rather than water. And so they won't be drinking the water anyways, right? This is just like risible, right? And the fact that there was no one else in the room who was as credible as Dow to say, no, don't poison people, change the, the calculus of this truth-seeking exercise. You don't even need to have the regulator be in the pocket of Dow. You just need to have the evidentiary record that the regulator is forced to rely on be tilted to Dow's interest because of its domination of its sector. Well. Yeah. Uh, you just remind me of the theme of a current movie out, uh, Evil Does Not Exist. This is very principal about downstream. Uh, yeah. uh, one, one uh, are you an expert on uh, on fat absorption of toxins? You, you I am not. You? Okay, yeah. all right. I am not in any way. I, I, I just know that um, if someone were to tell me that the fact that I got a little chub around the middle means that I can be poisoned more, and that person stood to benefit by poisoning me, I'd want a second opinion. Or a third, yes. Um, okay, but uh, you you remind me of the a few, it hasn't been that long since the tech industry was not engaged in policy. Yeah. You know, we don't do policy, we do business. And the phone company has always been, of course, involved in policy and the ratio of uh, expenditures on policy R&D versus tech R&D was basically in, inverse of each other. So sure. the phone companies have been like 7% uh, uh, of their gross revenue on policy R&D. The tech companies yeah. would spend less than 1%. I mean, this was this was 10 years ago. Or yeah. Rough. And and now, of course, that's changed. And it, it yeah. was a calculation that, that uh, the, the phone company could make more Mm -hmm. money their, their purpose right with one line of regulation than it could with a million lines of code yeah so, so the difference here is cartelization so the best lawyers not the best engineers right optimize so the difference here is cartelization right if the if at&t if every time at&t spent a dollar on lobbying for a regulation that advantaged copper uh telecoms twisted pair infrastructure uh, Comcast spent a dollar on regulation that disadvantaged Twisted Pair, but advantaged uh, Coax, uh, it would be a wash, right? It's only when you get a cozy sector, right? Uh, which is to say a small sector. You can't be, co can't be cozy with a hundred people, right? Once, once the sector converges. So, you know, like the canonical example here wouldn't be telecoms, it'd be entertainment, copyright. You know, during the Napster Wars, you had a couple hundred tech companies SMEs for the most part, with a couple of dominant firms, Intel, Microsoft, and so on, but not even Apple was very big back then. Uh, and then you had seven entertainment companies, which is now five, that were a cartel that had a common set of positions on uh, copyright and the internet. 
And they were two orders of magnitude smaller in terms of gross turnover than the tech companies. But they always said one thing. And, you know, as someone who was involved in a lot of these questions, not because I wanted to make tech companies rich, but because I didn't want things like universal surveillance of the Internet in order to enforce copyright. I was ever frustrated by showing up in policy forums where a tech company would perceive a parochial advantage to selling out their users. Right. They would say, oh, I can get a preferential licensing terms on some entertainment content if I take a position that is counter to my user's best interests and you would have just you it would just be a wash you'd have the tech company that would say we cannot surveil our users for copyright infringement without surveilling them broadly we cannot interdict copyright infringement without interdicting all kinds of protected speech and then you'd have someone else who'd say no we totally can we totally can of course why not we have a magic copyright enforcement robot and it's going to make it happen right and you know for so long as that was the case uh, we lost. And, you know, what happened to tech after that was it merged to monopoly. You know, you look at Google. Google is a company that made one successful product 25 years ago. They made a search engine that was really good. And then, almost without exception, they have not made a successful product in-house since. Everything that they have that's a success, again, almost without exception, is something they bought in an anti-competitive merger, right? That, that's their uh, video documents, maps, collaboration, server management, their whole ad tech stack, their mobile stack, all of it comes from someone else. Apple brings home 90 companies a year, right? Tim Cook is giving his shareholders a new company more often than you are bringing home a bag of groceries for your kids. And so these are companies that basically cleaned out the competition, right, by, by, by merging with them by doing what the telcos did, right? You know, you look at the history of AT&T and it's a history of predatory acquisitions of rural telephone co-ops started in the New Deal, right? They grew out of the rural electrification co-ops and regionals. And then, you know, you have the breakup in 82 and then immediately that's the last thing antitrust law ever does. And so antitrust law does not step up when AT&T's um, uh, constituent parts merge back again into new monopolies. Uh, and so that's the you know, that's the story, right? If you want um, firms that are attuned to their customers' interests, you have to create consequences for disappointing your customers. Yeah. And uh, these these companies do not face those consequences because they've cornered their markets. And as a result of that breakup uh, that was supposed to allow AT&T to compete in the local market, which they couldn't, mm -hmm. uh, they bailed out. They said, if you don't own a wire to the residents, then you're out of the game. And they yep. moved their capital into the cable business where they could find a wire and then sold yep. the name. Yeah. Uh, Corey, uh, a last word right. here for, you know, where advice for action, I guess we would, in a word. Think about your coalitions, right? Think of, I mean, libraries do this already because they're so important in terms of uh, the, you know, having become the, uh, public institution of last recourse in an era of the, the wholesale dismantling of our public institutions. And so, you know, you already serve this coalition of people who need, like, not just people who like to read, but people who need air conditioning and people who need to, uh, uh, an internet connection and, and, and what have you. There are bigger coalitions to be had. You know, like there's an obvious coalition as you chafe under overdrive under KKR there's an obvious coalition with people who work for other sectors where KKR has made incursions, right? Like they, they, they're about to buy Simon & Schuster. They bought recorded books, but they also own like funeral homes where they are um, raising prices and lowering quality and engaging in predatory conduct, right? You have a common cause with people out there who don't know it, right? Who don't understand that the author of their misery, the reason that pet groomer killed their dog is because KKR cut corners on it. And it's the same reason that, you know, it's getting harder to get audiobooks and ebooks. If you can help people understand that they are your allies in this fight against these, these giant corporations, then we stand a much better chance. You know, something that's happening glo globally with antitrust enforcement that's really interesting is that when one antitrust regulator develops a record and takes an enforcement action against a global firm, that can become a template for other uh, actors. So, you know, the lawsuits about Apple and its app store market are using the same records developed in, in courts 
and in regulatory forums in the UK, in Europe, in South Korea, Japan, and in the US, because the conduct is the same in all of those countries. And there are actual explicit cooperations, consortia being built of antitrust regulators, because they all have loosely similar antitrust laws, mostly because um, most of the world's antitrust laws are uh, the product of the Marshall Plan. US technocrats went around the world after World War II and gave everyone American uh, antitrust laws, but also because the companies are the same companies everywhere and they do the same they commit the same crimes everywhere so once you know where to look for the the crime in one place you can find it in the next country without having to look too hard you have the same possibility with these with these um uh, private equity funds that are the authors of your own misery wonderful uh, i i think you've uh, just opened up a new field of literacy uh tech policy literacy if there's something sure. librarians should be good at, that should be it. Not necessarily, yeah. you know, campaigning for public policy. It's it's a dicey proposition for civil servants. But uh, as far as helping people understand the environment they're in and how they can take action according to their own beliefs is is what libraries do. And librarians are just wonderful, oh, wonderful people. So yeah. thank you again, Corey. So great All to have right. you back. Uh, we'll, we'll look for you next year. Hopefully this will have taken hold and we'll see some action on that. So that'd be great. Thanks again. All right. See you again. Talk Bye. later. Bye. Stop the recording.